Hi, I am here today with a guy named Elephant Philosophy, or that's really the title or name of his YouTube channel. I came across him, when was it, about two to three months ago at this point, and after I think probably the first video that I watched, I was like, this guy is pretty cool. I like his videos. So I decided to share his videos with uh, with the audi- with my audience on like the, the community tab on my website, or on the uh, the YouTube channel and anyways, and then also on our Facebook page, I shared some of his videos. And uh, he's ballooned since then up in, in popularity. I'm really, really happy to see that because his videos are just really, really cool. So I just thought it would be awesome to have him on the channel uh, because I watched so many of his videos. It's actually funny. But anyways, thanks for coming on. How should I refer to you, by the way? It's just Elephant, Ellie, E, EP? How should uh, I refer Pascal to you? Pascal if you want. Pascal, okay. Uh, well, Pascal, yeah, tell funny. the audience... <laughs> Tell the audience a little about who you are. And by the yeah. way, I should mention that I've got your YouTube channel linked in the description of this video. So if you want to check out Pascal or EP or Elephant Philosophy, his YouTube channel, some of his videos and everything, the link to his channel is in the description. It's super easy to find. But but Pascal, tell me uh, and tell the audience a little about your background. Obviously, you're, you're wanting to stay anonymous, but tell me about your background in philosophy, how you kind of got interested in apologetics. Uh, the title of this video actually is A Hardcore Atheist, The Philosophy That Led You to Embrace Christianity. So we're going to get to that in just a, a second. But I want to hear more about your background. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for shouting me out. Uh, when you did that, I had 200 to 250 followers. I don't quite remember. Afterwards, I had 1,800. So thanks for that. Now the... Um, yeah, now it's actually risen to above 2,500, so it's pretty cool. So thank you for that. Uh, yes, I am just a regular dude from Europe, very, very secularized Europe. And um, I was growing up, so to say, a very convinced atheist. So, mm-hmm. And due to the internet, due to YouTube starting, due to the wave of the new atheists coming on, I got into philosophy, religion, and completely changed my worldview. Uh, I can give you, if you want a, a very basic backstory, I would say um, Europe is a very, very secularized place, and uh, most people will still self-identify as Christians, but they're not really practicing Christians, right? They, I believe many of them are just is leaning agnostics and um, the strong process of, process of secularization especially in northern and western Europe uh, especially happened with younger people and in my teens I was definitely non-religious atheistic really um, I yeah I mean I refer to you as a hardcore quantum. atheist would sorry to interrupt That's, you but would you would you identify as that or like someone who who's just really really convinced that atheism is true would you ever like I was consider totally yourself convinced. an anti-theist. Totally convinced. No, not really. I was uh, sympathetic to the goodwill of the people in the Christian faith, but I never, in once in a million years, would have considered um, theism or, or or Christianity, especially to be true. So, I was interested in quantum mechanics and physics in general, and moderately interested in philosophy, I'd say, but deeply entrenched in a mindset that takes the non-existence for God as just a self-evident, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as an antiquated worldview or relic of the past that has simply been... Pascal, you're kind of cutting out a little bit. Let's wait a second. Oh, uh, looks like he backed out, actually. Or maybe he's calling me. Uh, I mentioned at the actually before we went live that we were having some technical difficulties. So let me see if I can get him, him back here. So just one second while I try to call him. Technical difficulties live are always the, the most fun, uh, difficulties. So, okay. Um, oh, this is just not the truth for many is. people. I think it's hey just Pascal, obvious you, to them. Pascal, you cut out for, I would say, about the last yep. minute. So I'm trying to remember uh, where oh. you were. You were you were saying that you were not, uh, you never in a million years thought that, or you, you were taking, you took atheism to be sort of self-evidently true. Uh, yes, I actually did. I thought it was just um, 
Theism, in in general, was a relic of the past, right? It is yeah. something that depicts a man in the sky because people in ancient times or just centuries ago had no explanatory resources. The only resources they really had were agent-based resources, agent cause, agent cause, agent explanations, and that's where religion grew out of. Now, for many people in the secularized West, I would say this is not only the to them, it's just completely obvious. And I, I basically was on that team, if you want to call it that. Well, let's talk about, let's get into some of the philosophy that led you down the path from atheism to theism and then eventually to Christianity. So what was like the first thing that you came across that made you really think, oh, wait a second, this might actually be true? Yes, yeah, so when, when uh, in 2006, I think, YouTube came up and the new atheists were all the rage. And, uh, yeah, you could listen to Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, and they got going around the same time, and I was listening to them. And back then I thought, they're at least not afraid to state the obvious. They were very straightforward, stating that God is a man-made myth. Claims of the theistic religions, according to them, were just false. And around the time I... I thought such honesty is actually refreshing. And um, Christopher Hitchens was simply a phenomenal speaker, charismatic, hyper-eloquent bloke, somebody who was fun to listen to. So when he published his book, God Isn't That Great, he was doing a book tour through the U.S. all throughout the Bible Belt, and he was debating people like Dinesh D'Souza, Douglas Wilson, even Al Sharpton, a lot of people. And I felt he was doing great until he actually debated somebody who quite knew his stuff. And that was, of course, William Lane Craig. And yeah, Craig actually made a case for the existence of God, a case that simply overwhelmed Christopher Hitchens. Craig laid out an analytically precise, well-structured, validly formalized arguments. And those weren't the kinds of arguments that a rhetorician like Hitchens was able to deal with. Right? And uh, Craig wiped the floor with him. And... Um, yeah, Hitchens had no clue how to deal with sophisticated arguments for the existence of God. And that's how it all it sparked my interest. And I got to know a whole new world for, I mean, sophisticated philosophy of religion. And it all started from there. That's really cool. It's kind of similar to my story. I, the first person that I came across who actually gave like a really, yeah, if you want to use the term like analytic kind of approach to the whole question of God, God's existence and everything was, was Dr. Craig. And, and I think it was actually a lecture that I saw from him on the evidence for Christianity. And then after that, I was like, I got to look more into this guy. So, and he's, he's actually been on my channel a few times. So if you guys know who he is, then yeah. uh, definitely check out our, our, our archives. But so, okay. So he was the first one to basically kind of open up your mind to be like, okay, well maybe there's something else going on here. So was it Dr. Craig that you continued to look into, or did you what, tell, uh, take me the, the next step of the way? Isn't there a secular atheist Pascal, you, you cut out. just completely destroys? Pascal, you cut out. So uh, you, you, Yeah, you're back now, but uh, start over from the question of where did you go next? Okay. Okay, so first I wanted to find some sophisticated, quote-unquote, atheist philosopher who would just destroy crack, right? Right. I mean, that's not atypical. Everybody wants to kind of remain with their worldview. Nobody wants to really change their worldview because that's, an, that's also an emotional thing. So I searched for... I wanted to find the atheist philosopher that really destroys crack, and there was none. Even the sophisticated atheist philosophers, they made their case and they said reasonable things, but it wasn't like they were destroying anybody or they were just refuting his case. They just laid out a different case. And Craig often had the upper hand with even the most brilliant philosophers you can find on YouTube back then. Um, also around the time, there was a great website called Common Sense Atheism by a guy called Luke Mühlhauser. I think you know him. Do mm -hmm. you know the site? Mm -hmm. And that yeah, was he had a, a, he had a podcast he as had well. That point, yeah, he had a great podcast, but he he made the point 
the new atheists do not know what they're talking about and they're getting destroyed by sophisticated theistic philosophers. And if atheists want to keep up with this, if they do not want to just lose the debates and look foolish, they have to understand academic philosophy of religion. And that's what actually got me ever more deeper into it. Um, if We can actually go by arguments, if you like. Yeah, I mean, I would I would love to go argument by argument. I think that might actually be uh, be really cool. And then also, I definitely want to touch on what kind of convinced you to embrace Christianity in particular. You identify as a Christian, is that right? Exactly right. Yeah, it's really really awesome. I, well, I tell me about yeah, that too. It's also. Yeah, I watched your video on uh, on your story as well. So if if you guys want to hear more about his story. He does actually kind of go into some detail on this on his channel. He's got, I think, three total videos, so two on theism, and then the other one is uh, some philosophical arguments for Christianity. I assume that those played a part in your journey, but we'll talk a little bit more about them today in this uh, in this interview. But to, yeah, let's let's go through some of the arguments. What was one of the, what was like the first argument that you were like, okay, now I'm convinced by this. Um, I don't know if the first that I was convinced, but that the first argument is often the Kalam. It's precise, concise, and it's way easily formulated on the surface of it. You can easily understand what it's talking about. And um, that was the other one that I thought, I can, I can kind of have to deal with that. And hmm. um, yeah, that was something like the entry to sophisticated philosophy of religion. I quickly came to kind of realize that the universe was probably not past eternal. So my thoughts were more directed at a B-theoretic view of time, according to which time is a quasi-spatial temporal axis, and the universe just exists as this um, four-dimensional object. That was actually um, based on a on a quote on a well-known quote by William Lane Craig, who said that the Kalam is basically based on a tenth or eighth theory of time, and that was my view. I didn't want to be an atheist because I thought the universe is past eternal. And I thought that Craig's arguments, or not just William Lane Craig's, but the general arguments against an infinite past were very, very strong. So I thought, well, I don't want to base my worldview on an improbable proposal of an infinite past. So I really have to deal with the universe having a past space-time boundary. And then we have to look, well, does it need a cause? And that was basically, which is now, I think, still a very, I think, prominent view among atheists that there is this B-theoretic conception of time according to which the universe is just not, it's not really in need of an originating cause, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's kind of Graham Alpy's view, right? He's He thinks there's a first cause, but he thinks that first cause is necessary. That came out in, in the debate that you just reviewed between him and uh, Andrew Loke. Yeah, that, that's also a little bit different, but um, it's a general view that on a B theory of time, it's not true that whatever begins to exist has a cause, right? A lot of people think on a B theory of time that can very well the universe exist just as a four dimensional object and there is no cause, it just exists. Now that was the first view I was actually drawn to, but after a while I think doubts crept in. I came to think that it was incoherent to just dismiss the causal principle in relation to the universe's initial state. I thought that this is this sort of brings out an incoherence because such space-time space manifolds, such as the universe we live in, could potentially just begin at every moment. I thought it would lead to some kind of metaphysical chaos if you deny that whatever begins to exist must have a cause. Mm -hmm. And that's where my f real doubts about mantheism came in. That's real. That's really interesting. Yeah, let's go back to this uh, this idea of this four this four dimensional block of uh, space time. This idea that this is yeah. some some way to get sort of out of the Kalam cosmological argument. We'll camp on this argument for just a minute because there's just so much to say about it, yeah. including the the debate that I'm currently doing with uh, rationality rules, which you've done some interesting videos in response to. <laughs> um, yeah. So okay, I 
I have I, I used to think that that B theory posed a really serious problem to the Kalam cosmological argument, but as I looked into it and I polled philosophers currently working on this, that basically no one thinks that B theory has anything to do with the Kalam being sound or unsound. Cr Dr. Craig is actually in the minority of philosophers that I've personally talked to and asked about this because it's just very very easy to come up with a formulation of the Kalam that is uh, B theoretic compatible. And you, so it's basically just a matter of like cleaning up the language to be good with B theory, if, if B theory is true. So I don't, I, I'm having trouble seeing how B theory is, uh, poses any kind of threat whatsoever to the Kalam. So, so help me out, help me yeah, out with I this. No, I, I actually kind of, I agree with you. But okay. William Lane Craig is very pessimistic on this point. He said from start to finish, the Kalam is on an A theory or tense view of time. There is this quote, and William Lane Craig thinks that on the B theory, the universe doesn't become actual, right? B theory, the B theory or the eternalist view of time just proposes that all moments of time are actual, right? They are just you're just indexically at a certain point in time in the same way that you're in a certain point in space, right? And just because you're not over there doesn't mean that over there doesn't exist. So Craig thinks that since if that is the case, the universe doesn't come into being, the need for a cause, he called it misconceived. Now, yeah. I think this cannot be right because this just leads to metaphysical chaos. You're still asserting that things just can begin to exist without a cause. Mm -hmm. And that would not, if we then look at the universe, things just don't pop into existence, right? I mean, they just don't begin to exist even within yeah. an eternalist time frame. Right, exactly. There's always a cause for something that, that has a sort of first edge or front edge. So a horse comes into existence from, from something else, right? It doesn't just like come into being without any reason or without any cause. So, yeah, I just don't see how, I mean, so I think that the way that you would look at it is in your, your block of the universe. So if you're imagining, like I, I always imagine, I, I try to think visually. So I'm thinking of like a cube just floating in some kind of like vacuum and that's sort of all, right. everything that exists. So if that is your view of what time is, then the question is, is God in that cube or is God not in that cube? And so that's ultimately, I think, kind of what it comes back down to. Is like, I mean, to me, we're kind of, I don't want to get too off topic here. I want to get back to your story. But to me, the the, the real question, like the, the thing that separates theists and atheists, even down to like the Graham Oppies and Andrew Lokes, is like, what is the nature of the first cause or the uncaused thing that exists? And everybody has to agree that something exists without a cause, without something beyond it that caused it to exist. Theists think that that's God. Atheists think that it's some natural thing, some part of the universe. So everybody has to posit that there's some uncaused part of reality. I keep hitting this mic. But the question is, what is the nature of it? And I think that's ultimately what it comes back down to. But what are your thoughts on that before we uh, move on with in your journey? Yes, so everything... Uh, I think there is has to be some grounding of reality that exists by metaphysical necessity one way mm -hmm. or the other. Mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, historically speaking, theists really just won that debate. In the past, you had kind of Jungian ideas of chains of contingent objects just going back infin until infinity or something. As far as I know, these views are less and less defensible right now because of the great work of people like Alexander Proust, for example. And um, relating to the causal principle, it's really hard. If you give up the, the causal principle, if you insist that things can begin to exist without causes, you end up with metaphysical chaos, right? Everything could just pop into being, and that's not what we're seeing. So that are actually... You, that are actually, you... Yeah. So, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm wanting to stick on this point real quick. You're t you you've mentioned this this a uh, couple times now. Metaphysical chaos. If you deny the causal principle, it sounds like you are uh, thinking along the terms of the uh, 
of, of an argument that I read in Necessary Existence that was co-authored by Alexander Proust and Josh Rasmussen. I'm wondering if you're thinking about the same argument that I am, where basically they say, well, consider the set of all thing of all uncaused things that could just begin to exist without a cause, uh, or the the set of contingent things that could just pop into existence for no reason. If that set is not empty, then it'd be arbitrary to like limit that set to just one thing or two things or three things. So it's got to be infinitely large if that set has any members in it. But then the question is, what is the probability that some uncaused thing doesn't just pop into my field of vision in the next two seconds? And if there's infinitely many things that could do this, then it seems like we've got overwhelming that we've we've got to a if we think that the causal principle is false, we've got to be open to things just popping into existence in front of us all over the place all the time because there's infinitely many things that could do that, but they don't do that, and so that's overwhelming evidence that this causal principle is true. I'm wondering if you're thinking, uh, is that the kind of argument that you have in mind here about metaphysical chaos? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly true. The point is that if you allow for the idea that things can begin to exist without a cause, but you don't want this to end up in complete chaos, you need a restriction principle. You need to say things can begin to exist without a cause, but only in very few cases. And I just don't see how you can reasonably establish such a principle. You have to give it some metaphysical grounding some reason for why that is true. And if you already allow for the um, beginning of things without causes, why doesn't this just lead into complete nonsense like an ice bear just popping into existence on my head right now? It's very hard to ground such a principle. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think we just stick with the rather obvious principle that things that do begin to exist do so because they have an originating cause. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Okay, let's. Uh, I, we could camp on the Kalam the whole interview, but let's turn to the yeah, next yeah, argument that you looked at. Because the, the contingency argument is still my favorite argument, even though I've been yeah. really focused on the Kalam recently. <laughs> the contingency argument is still like just top dog, hands down to me. So w is that where you I went love next? Contingency arguments. Yeah. Yeah, I, I. Around the time that I actually converted to theism, I wasn't yet that convinced of the Kalam, but I definitely thought contingency arguments succeed at a certain point. Um, mm. it, it's really the argument that mostly convinced me that theism is true, not alone, but mostly. And the central idea is, of course, that a necessary being has to be the grounding of contingent reality. Contingent reality cannot be brute, exist without grounding or explanation. So Alexander Proust and George Rasmussen both presented contingency arguments that rest on a very weak principle of sufficient reason. It's merely the claim that all contingent propositions may have an explanation. But this principle, as they showed, really entails the existence of a necessary being. And even if there is still what philosophers call a gap problem, the problem of showing that this necessary being is the god of classical theism, this is already a good reason to take theism very, very seriously, I think. Amen to that. Yeah, the, the contingency argument. I, when, I, when I first came across Josh Rasmussen's work, and uh, I really started to grasp like what he was arguing, his version of the contingency argument, I was like, there's a, there's basically no way out of this. There is no way out of getting the, you've got to accept that some kind of necessary being or necessary thing exists. But then the question is, and this is this is why I keep going back to this all the time, is like the difference between theist and atheist is what is the nature of that necessary thing? And that's that's exactly where Graham Oppie jumped off. This gap problem that you talked about. Yeah, that's uh man, right. anyways, let's let's keep yeah, let's keep going. Um you, you've made a video yeah, on a, almost every would... argument, so we could go any any direction pretty much, but I'll, I'll yeah. leave it up to you. I just want to say something about the gap problem. Now, it's I think theism has an explanatory advantage here. It is contra-causal free will. You have to ask yourself, suppose that there is a necessary being, a necessary entity from which from whose existence it follows that there are contingent facts. But how can this be? If a necessary fact entails another fact, that means if it follows from this necessary fact, 
by necessity that another fact is true, that fact would be necessary as well. That is an old argument that Peter Van Inwagen made in the 80s, I think, where he said a necessary proposition cannot really explain a contingent proposition because explanation means entailment. But here the theist has a real advantage. He can say God exists necessarily, but by the free decision of this contractually free entity, God, that is free in a libertarian sense. It doesn't follow from, with necessity that God wills a certain world or wills to create this universe or that. It follows contingently. And that's how contingent facts follow from a necessary fact. All right, I don't have a whole lot more thoughts on that, so I will uh, I'll leave it leave it there. Let's let's move on to uh, to ontological arguments. Have you in, in your journey and everything was that something that played a, a big significant part in accepting theism, or or where do you currently sit on it now? No, I love ontological arguments, and in its most basic form, they just state that if the tra- if the traditional current then God exists. And I Wait, think that uh, the repeat that last. God is coherent. Repeat that last thing. You cut out a little bit. Oh, I said um, ontological arguments in their most basic form. They just state that if the traditional concept of God is coherent, then God exists. And I think the concept of God is coherent. Okay. Uh, what about the reverse ontological argument? How do you respond to that? So the, the reverse ontological argument says, well, it seems possible that God doesn't exist. seems possible that atheism is true um, in the same way that it seems possible that God I'm does exist. There. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you again. So you're talking about the reverse ontological argument. Can you just repeat that? Yeah, I was just explaining the, uh, the, one of the, the top objections to the ontological argument excuse me, that's uh, currently existing in the literature. It's also the, the argument that's given me the most uh, serious amount of doubt about the ontological argument, and I'm still kind of on the fence about it, given this uh, this concern, this objection. So the reverse ontological argument, as you well know, but it, for the audience, goes like this. So the ontological argument says it's possible that God exists. If it's possible that God exists, then God exists. Well, it's possible that God doesn't exist is a reverse ontological argument. If it's possible that God doesn't exist, then it follows that God doesn't exist because God is either necessary or impossible. So then that's basically the the issue. How do you motivate the possibility premise that you need for the ontological argument to succeed when it seems like you could just use the same type of argument for the reverse ontological argument and conclude that God doesn't exist? Yes, so first of all, we have a certain conception of the um, nature of God or of the concept. We know that classically God is omnipotent, omniscient, holy good, or omnibenevolent, and, and certain other. And nobody in the history of philosophy has ever been shown, uh, have been able to show that there is just this clear connection between two attributes, right? That is some evidence for the coherence of this concept, right? And if we just look at it, it seems kind of obvious attributes do not stand in contradictory relations that's what the first reply would give okay i'm uh, yeah i'm I'm on board with you there i'm I'm also thinking of uh yujin nagasawa's way out of this and then also ben arbor's Uh, there's there's definitely been some responses to this this problem even some some uh very recently as well so what what is your you said that was your first response what are your others Yes, I would actually take a line that Ben Arbor did give. It's that we should think of something as possible if we have some conception of its nature or or concept and we can't find a flaw. That, I think, is is obvious. If you want to motivate the possibility premise, you can also take as auxiliary evidence other arguments, such as the Kalam, such as the fine-tuning, such as the contingency arguments, and they kind of cry out for some necessary explanation. And I think that's also a good way to show that, well, we have some evidence on our side here. What the non-theist can, of course, do, he can point to various evils in the world. He can say, well, possibly there's gratuitous evil in some world. Um, 
Michael Maida actually does this. He said, it's, my modal intuitions tell me that there is a possible world that contains gratuitous evil. That would be my against it. Um, it is, of course, not so clear cut. But what I like about this, and this is really, it poses the question to the atheist, I give you this concept of a necessary being that has certain maxed up properties. Given the fact that it is not contradictory, I would think that this is possible. So there is a possible world in which this being exists via the modal logic S5, it exists. And I think that's actually pretty good. And we can all pit the other arguments against each other, but if we are already convinced for theism, apart from the ontological arguments are good, so much stronger is the ontological argument. Okay, let's t let's go away from the arguments for God's existence, which, uh, I mean, we could talk about that all day, and let's move into some of your reasons for embracing Christianity in particular. So we've gone through a list of arguments so far for uh, traditional arguments in favor of the truth of theism. What about Christianity? What was it about, uh, what, what, what argument or philosophical argument led you to embrace Christianity? Okay, so I first want to say something about this. Um, I'm not against a historical case for the resurrection, but I have a worry that such a case might create a false expectation. So I'm skeptical about the scope of such argumentation. I don't think it can establish the resurrection with an overwhelming certainty. Rather, it can shift the probability structure so that the odds, if you will, aren't completely stacked against it, but slightly favor it. But if the idea arises that Christianity can only be rationally accepted as being true if one has this overwhelming proof of the resurrection on historical grounds, then I think that's detrimental. It creates the illusion that there are no lines of evidence for the truth of Christianity apart from historical facts, and I think that's just wrong. Um, if we already assume uh, accept theism, then I think we can base our reasoning on the assumption that God exists. And then if that's true, we can ask the question, is it reasonable to think that God has revealed himself in history? And if we believe that, then by that line of thinking, if we agree that God likely already revealed himself, now we can actually compare religions, right? Yeah, would you like me to pick up here? Oh, uh, yeah, well, you can say... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... So is this this almost sounds like Richard Swinburne's approach in his book, The uh, Resurrection of God Incarnate, where he basically argues that you've got to inflate the prior probability of God's wanting to become incarnate and uh, and do something like a resurrection. So that sounds to me like it would go sort of hand in hand with a historical case, not necessarily that it would be in conflict with one. No, no, I don't think that's a, that's a con conflict at all. Um I would just think, um, if we think about... Yeah, your point was that it, it paints false expectations. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't like, I could uh, get the idea that unless you are just totally convinced on the basis of historical facts, you cannot really become a Christian because it creates mm -hmm. this idea that only historical facts can guide you to the truth. And I think that's often detrimental. Um, I would rather think that if we already accept that God has revealed himself in history, well, then we can look at religions and we can look what kind of picture of the human predicament they have, of the human fate, of morality, of... Uh, of and we can compare them. And then we can see what religion comes to the truth. And I think that's also a good way of getting a truth, sort of by ab abductive reasoning. We just look what kind of art options we have and then we get to the truth that way so okay so here's a here's a worry that i've got for this line of thinking is that basically what it seems like you're doing at that point is comparing theology so jewish theology christian theology muslim theology uh i think those are pretty much the only monotheistic religions on on offer i'm thinking obviously in broad terms here so but it sounds to me like if we're comparing theologies that's still going to involve some kind of historical investigation because 
the theology that we have, for example, of Christianity is built on these sort of manuscripts that we have, this manuscript evidence. So you've got to take into account like textual criticism and all of these areas that do affect history, historical thinking. So I think that ultimately you still are going to have to do some kind of historical investigation or historical argument and evidence that's going to bolster the, the, the underpinnings of the theologies, the various theologies that you're comparing when you're running this type of argument. What are your thoughts on that? No, I agree, and I'm not a I'm not opposed to his uh, arguments from certain historical facts. I just don't think they should be the only game in town. Okay. Okay, so you see them all so, as, as sort of working together, but it, yeah, so that, that 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 is good though. To oh, okay, so I think I think my concern though is that I so so I guess you're wanting to combine history and philosophy. I'm trying to to paint your your view here in a way that makes sense to me. So it sounds... I think I think both cases can exist on their own, but why would that necessarily be that somebody only takes historical facts or only philosophical facts? Life is complicated. There are a lot of mm -hmm. factors to weigh in that weigh in on a certain decision. So if you create this false expectation that we have to prove the resurrection with the certainty of 99%, that seems to create the false impression that that is actually feasible and that it's necessary. And I don't think that that's the point. I think there are other points, though. Sorry, I've actually, uh, my camera just, like, showed something that was too hot. So now I've got a black screen here, and you've got this elephant. And so that's how we're going to roll for the rest of this interview. I'm going to try to blow some cold air on my camera, see if I can get it working. But for the rest of this interview, it's going to be super, uh, super visually compelling. Black, half black, half... Uh, half elephant. So, well, let's let's continue down the interview. So that was one of the the lines of evidence or, or considerations, philosophical considerations that led you toward Christianity. Did the historical case, like the traditional historical case from Gary Habermas, Mike Lacona, uh, even William Lane Craig, who we've already talked about, and Richard Swinburne, who I've talked about as as well. Other, I mean, there's there's a lot yeah, of other guys that have that have done work on this. But did that argument play a role for you as well? Uh, yeah, it's showing me that the evidence is far better than somebody who had never delved into it could possibly imagine. Because the who? normal thing is, it's just, and I, I said, I think you mentioned it also that you had certain doubts pertaining to even the existence of uh, of Jesus until you looked into it. And that's certainly the same with me. I, I didn't know what kind of evidence uh, there was for the um, for the gospel narratives or anything. And if you're looking at people produce evidence, it's very important. I'm not against historical evidence at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I did have that. I mean, I had I had that doubt for like I think 30 minutes. I was doubting whether or not Jesus existed, and then <laughs> I found Josephus, and that pretty much put it to bed for me. But and that was that was also years ago. But yeah, that I mean, my, my journey is very similar in that I, when I first learned that my brother became an atheist, I started to really look hard, deep, deep into the evidence. And the historical arguments that I found really blew me away. Have you read The Sun Rises by Dr. Craig? No, no, I didn't. That, that book is really, really short, and I, I recommend it as often as I think to recommend it. But that book really solidified in me the the type of case that one can build the uh, an historical case because he goes through like one of the, one of the things that was so compelling to me was how much you can just like completely decimate these other explanations these other potential explanations like the conspiracy hypothesis the swoon hypothesis these other competing naturalistic ex explanations of the historical facts that have, you know, really good historical underpinning, you can rule out those other naturalistic explanations with ex with with a ridiculous amount of certainty. It's it's crazy, and I, I didn't think I was going to find that. So I'm I'm a, I'm totally on board with you there. That it was it's a whole lot stronger I than think, I um, was expecting to find. I also think that people should look into uh, Tim and Lydia McGrew's work on the resurrection, and they have this paper based on uh, a Bayesian, it's actually a Bayesian case for the resurrection, and uh, one doesn't have to agree with 
the um, of the, of this case. They have certain multiplicators that they use, but the overall structure is really compelling. And I think Tim and Lydia McGrew they do awesome scholarship because they're very very smart people. I think they did they did make a very strong case there. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. that. Their work on this and their that article, by the way, that you're that you're talking about, they wrote an article. I think it's about 60, 70 pages long. It was their co contribution to the Blackwell Companion of Natural Theology, yeah, and that Blackwell. essay, that paper, is available for free on Liddy McGrew's website. You can actually just search for it, and you can find it there. One of the things that they're so great at is they are hardcore Bayesians. And so they build their case on like some of the most contemporary philosophical yes. uh, thought on on probability. So they they go real deep into probability theory and make it all kosher and work with contemporary thought on how probability arguments are supposed to function and operate. And they consider the prior probability. They look at the Bayes factor, and yeah, it's uh, it's just really really good. Definitely recommend checking that out. And again, it's free, so you can just search for it. And and go that route. Yes, well, I'd like to. I'd like well to. And I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, what I like actually about it is you can always read the argument in the normal literal form from any, that you could read it from any normal historian, and after that they would put it in Bayesian form, and you just learn a lot through that. It's very good. Yeah, they are they are great. I've had Tim on uh, the channel a couple times as well. Lydia, Lydia too. They're they're both awesome. They're both really cool. Okay, well, what, are are you open to taking some questions from the live audience? Uh, I, I will, but I, w I wanted to make another argument uh, from from a philosophical p uh, perspective for Christianity, if I may. Okay. Yeah, let's do that first, and then. Uh, any, any other thoughts that you'd like to, to share before we move to Q&A? Feel free to make all of those now. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say is that we have to think what religion captures the truth of the human condition, the human predicament. Which, relig which religion understands the and really offers redemption? Which religion offers unconditional love, forgiveness instead of rules to just follow and commands to obey? I would give an argument from most by providence to the truth of the Christian worldview because if God knows, and that's maybe a little bit tactical, but if God knows of creaturely freedom, if he knows what a given person would do in all given circumstances, then we stand before God not in the light of that we may have done, good or bad, but in the light of a whole moral being or innermost moral essence. God knows what you would have done if 1763 or something in Spain or something it seems to me be on the face of it very different I think in this case let's see that we are we stand in need of forgiveness and moral cleansing and no other religion emphasizes these virtues quite like Christianity does that's it all right yeah sorry about that I was uh, I'm still trying to figure out what's going on with my camera so I'm doing all this behind <laughs> the scenes. Well, all right. Well, let me uh, let me go ahead and pull up a uh, question here from Sentinel Apologetics. You may have heard of him. I, have you heard of this guy, Sentinel Apologetics? I guess I did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's he's pretty good. You guys should go should go check him out as well. In addition to Elephant Philosophy, go check him out. All right. So here's his question. He says, if you combine A with B, you get G theory or God time or three plus non Euclidean dimensions of time. This was the perspective between William Lane Craig and Hugh Ross. Do you have any comments or thoughts on that? I can also read it again if you'd like me to. Um, no, I understood it. I just don't think I'm competent to comment on that. Is this Fair some enough. kind of approach to nonlinear time or something? I'm I'm not sure. This this question is above my pay grade. So I'm I, happy to know leave it in your capable hands. Okay, let's... Uh, okay, sorry about that, Sentinel. If you can uh, pose your question in a different way, then I will try to uh, to ask it live here. All right, we've got a, another super chat from Landon Matocha, Matochos. Matochos. Here is his question. Why... Uh, whoops, that the pulled up the wrong one. Here we go. Come on, Landon. 
Why does any inference drawn from what happens inside the universe, like causality and time, work for the universe as a whole? Yeah, that's actually a good question, but you have to ask the general question. If you just take the universe as a given, surely you can take um, causality as just one of its properties, but that totally uh, leaves you unable to answer the question of the existence of the universe in the first place. If you think causality is just a function of what happens inside the universe, the universe itself will be completely unexplained to you. It will just be a mystery, right? Yeah, that, so what what I think about when I when I see this question is there are certain arguments for the the uh, something like the principle of sufficient reason being necessary. So if something is necessary, then it's just true no matter what you're talking about, whether it's sort of inside or outside the universe. And that to me, outside the universe doesn't make a whole lot of sense to to use that type of language. So I'm I'm skeptical that we should even be using that type of language, depending on what we mean by universe as well. But so if the principle of sufficient reason is necessary, then it would apply no matter what. And so if we have arguments for a principle like that being necessary, then that would take care of this this kind of concern. Yeah. Yes, and if you take the brute fact approach and you just say, well, there are certain truths that are true for no reason, well, of course, you're never going to have a problem. Why is that so? Well, it's no reason. It's just true. But that... that all our reality becomes just a all too good coincidence, you know. The regularity, mm -hmm. the conformity of nature is really no longer well explained. And so you cannot really rest on brute facts. That's why somebody like Graham Arpey now, now accepts something like the principle of sufficient reason, even in a modest form, because people have realized you cannot do without a certain version of the principle of sufficient reason and, be, and get a metaphysics that actually makes some sense. Okay, let's move on to another question, which is very, very important from Maverick Christian. And you, I think you've interviewed him on your channel, right? Right, yeah. Have you had Maverick Christian on? Yeah, we discussed um, an argument about uh, an argument for the impossibility of moral nat uh, knowledge given naturalism. Well, his, his question is, my question, why elephant philosophy? Where's the elephant coming from? Uh, elephants are kind of cute. <laughs> That's it. There's no, there's no deep reason. You could give some reason like, oh, elephants, they're these majestic creatures and they have this great memory and they sort of, uh, it's a good metaphor for the philosopher. It's none of that. I just like elephants. Like, okay. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, elephants, uh, uh, this is just coincidence, are, are my mom's favorite animal. My mom is like obsessed with elephants. <laughs> She's always talking about them. She's anytime I'm th trying to think of a gift to get her, it's just elephants, just some something <laughs> elephant. So yeah, that's funny. All right, uh, here's another super chat, yeah, a big one from collecting elephants too. So <laughs> oh, nice, nice. You should take some pictures and and use those for your channel. All right, from Russell Jones, he says elephant philosophy is awesome. I liked your last argument about the moral human condition given Molinist freedom. It's also a defense of intrinsic sinfulness. Is there uh, if there is even a possible world where you sin, you are not perfect. Uh, you have any, I don't know. Any could could you repeat the last part? I didn't quit. Uh, he I didn't said, quit the I, last part. Well, let me read the whole thing again. Elephant philosophy is awesome. I liked your last argument about the moral human condition given Molinist freedom. It's also a defense of intrinsic sinfulness. If there is even a possible world where you sin, you are not perfect. Yes, I think that if God sees your moral being in all its possibilities, you're really standing with no excuse and all you can ask for is forgiveness. This is true in other versions of Christianity or other theological doctrines too, but with Molinism it's pretty on point. God knows what you would have done in any conceivable situation. And in this sense it's clear that you know, morally fallen nature or morally nature is so obvious to God that he can only forgive you. You can only ask for forgiveness. Your deeds, and whether good or bad, they're sort of accidents of the world God has put us, say. And from this Molinistic view of providence, I think 
Christianity seems kind of almost commonsensical. Okay, we've got another super chat from Uber asking about your own personal experiences. He says, he or she, Elephant philosophy, do you have any personal experience with Jesus or did you come to Christianity solely through philosophy? Uh, I had certain mystical experiences right after I I first sort of quote unquote converted to sort of deism. I was a theist for a couple of years before I actually converted to Christianity. And I do had some mystical experiences right there. I can actually rem remember my first, that was a couple of days after I first said myself, damn, I'm a theist now. I was actually in bed and I thought, this just, for, for just a few minutes, I had this feeling of this truth that I'm now committed to is just overwhelming. It was almost almost a little bit gloomy, not in the sense of being being threatening, but it was, that was a real, I never had before. Wow, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I mean, as it, my myself, I'm I'm a whole lot different. I grew up in a Christian home, and we we were even in a charismatic church for I think the most the majority of our childhood and everything. So I would de I definitely would say that I've had religious experiences. So we're very very different in that regard. I this is also kind of irrelevant and Im important along these lines, and I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts on this. A lot of times, atheists who see a Christian who grew up a Christian and then is doing apologetics, they'll be like, oh, well, you just want to believe what you sort of grew up believing. The way that I look at it now in my own personal life is, yes, I started out as a Christian and then I started to look into the evidence. So what explains why I was a Christian is my upbringing and the sort of surroundings that I was, that I was just sort of found myself in. But the reason why I'm still a Christian today is because of the evidence, because of the arguments in favor of it. In addition to, I mean, there's 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 a variety of different things that explain why someone is or and holds whatever position that they do. It's probably not just going to boil down to one big thing or one main thing or, or just one thing in general. So what are your thoughts on that, on this this claim that some atheists make? Well, this is sort of psychologizing, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think that these kind of concerns have great validity for intellectual purposes. Or to me, that's why I just talked about this experience was that I was just not given assent to some kind of abstract proposition when I realized that I really believe that there is this got a necessary being that created the universe and has had certain probably at that time certain moral and other kind of attributes was sort of like me realizing there is a whole higher reality and that was sort of it was a little bit shocking at first but it showed me that i'm just not affirming a, an abstract proposition but that i really came to believe it let me ask this one last question from the audience, and then we're going to move to uh, the last section of this interview that I'm going to ask you some uh, some questions, and I'll, I'll explain what I'm going to do at the, in the very last portion of this interview here. But here's a question from John Michael Salinas. He says, what are EP's thoughts on the argument from the applicability of mathematics? Yes, there's a reason that I have not made um, a video on the debate between William Lane Craig and Graham Oppy on this because my thoughts are really a little bit confused on this. I do not think that it's just that good of an argument because I think the alternatives to the mathematical applicability, they're just twofold, as William Lane Craig gives them. Either complete mm -hmm. chaos or a very simple type of mathematical structure that is just addition. And I still have no way to conceive of that. I think Ray Moppy may very well be right that physical reality can only be um, mathematically profound, if you want to call it like that, and therefore it may be necessary. But I should look deeper into this issue. I just wasn't that initially interested in the matter. And I think that the atheist line or the Graham Oppie style line of just thinking about the mathematical applicability um, for the... Uh, for the uh, physical laws or just of, for the nature of the universe being necessary, I could kind of understand that. 
I think it's a reasonable position. So I'm not that convinced of the strength of this argument. Yeah, it's it's an argument that I'm completely confused by. I don't really understand how it's supposed to work yeah. or what are the what are the alternatives. It's just a really perplexing argument to me. Even even though I did that breakdown of the argument with uh, David Hutchins and yeah. we we like broke down the whole debate to a level that a high school student could understand, it's still confusing to this day. That argument is just really weird. This is this is the benefit of the contingency argument. It is so easy to comprehend i think once you understand just some of the basic language concepts that are involved like what does contingency mean what does necessary mean i mean concepts like explanation and cause are relatively intuitive so you don't have to do a whole lot of brain power work there but th man th these arguments are just so good and they're they're great okay let me turn to uh the last section of the interview that i want to do with you and i want to ask you some questions about my debate with rationality rules because you've okay. produced some videos on these. And uh, before we do that though, I want to talk to the audience and let them know how they can support the ministry. So if you're watching this and you want to, see, if you see value in these the type of videos that I'm producing here and you want to help support this ministry, continue to go forward, we're, we're closing in on the, on the end of the year. So this is also a great time to give to a nonprofit ministry like Capturing Christianity for tax purposes and, and everything like that. So let me just tell you how you can do that. You can go to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity to support the ministry. You can support it at any amount that you would like. If you'd like to do a one-time donation, you can go to our website, capturingchristianity.com slash donate. Links to both of these are in the description of the video if you would like to support the ministry and help keep doors open and uh, keep things running and videos being pumped out like this all the time. So there's a whole lot more that I could say about supporting the ministry and everything, but let's get back to the interview. So EP, here's my here's my question. Do Because I know that you, the, the first video that you did about Stephen's uh, rebuttal, his most recent rebuttal, was very, very, uh, I think vitriolic is the term that I would use, and you probably agree with that. Do you think that you went too far? Uh, you mean the second one? The first one was, I think, pretty neutral in language. The second one is it? Well, you did, I think you did, two, uh, I think you've done three. So you, you did the, re, you did the, re, um, the response to his opening statement, and that one was a, was a separate video, but then you've made two videos in response to his second video. And the reason why I'm referring to his exactly. as videos, yeah, the, the reason why I'm referring to his as videos because yes. it's not really clear if his opening statement was an opening statement as it was a rebuttal. So I could call it a first rebuttal or in a second rebuttal or opening okay, statement okay, and rebuttal. Right, yeah. So the second, the first video that you did to his most recent video in response to the video that, that everyone has seen and it's sort of the last video up until this point in time, that vi the first video that you did was very vitriolic. It was uh, you, even the thumbnail itself yeah. had a, you know, you painted a clown face on him. So do you think that you went too far with that? A little bit, but I stand with that. I stand with what I said, but I guess I agree, actually. Yeah. Yeah, see, as Christians, and I, I'm not trying to like, this is not meant to like call you out in public or on the air or anything, but I just wanted to sort of talk through some of these subjects with you. I think it's important. But the the approach that I take with this whole thing and with uh, in response to Stephen and the way that he's replied and how the debate is gone, the way that I approach this is just back, it comes back to 1 Peter 3.15. You've got to do it in gentleness and respect. And so when I'm thinking through yes. arguments and responding to him, there's a whole lot of things that I would like to say that I can't say because that's just not how... You know, we're called to, to act as ambassadors for Christ. So, yeah, how how can we do how can we do better at that? And I want to I want to call you because I think that your stuff is amazing, by the way. It's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm having you on the channel, why I pushed out your stuff. I think it's just it's, it's very needed and it's awesome. But at the same time, I think that there's a whole lot of room to uh, to emulate Christ and to to bring people to a knowledge of Christ through that. And obviously there are different ways that you can approach this and, and even different cultures. There's, you know, some, some people view what I'm doing as uh, as weakness and it's not convincing because it's too meek and it's too mild and it's not, uh, you know, angry enough and, and it's not uh, attacking straight on, that, that kind of thing. So I know that there's sort of cultural things going on here, but I don't know, I just wanted to, to have a kind of conversation about 
that aspect and fo- focusing on yes, loving yes, the person uh, behind the arguments. Yes, I, I know that I was I was really in a um, I was a little bit angry at this uh, rebuttal that I was criticizing. So if you remember when I criticized um, or when I made a video on both of your opening statements or on his first video that he did, I was mm-hmm. pretty neutral language and I was just but the second video that he made just was completely dishonest and condescending at the same time because it was obvious to me that he didn't understand why for what purpose you introduced for example the grim reaper argument right he thought that and this is what he said in the video you have to apply this paradox to the whole universe that's what he said in his first rebuttal to you and after you kind of set him clear on that it was clear that he understood and I think he understands that, but he wouldn't admit it. He was just double. And then he alleged that he had, in some sense, defeated the Grim Reaper paradox. And then he moved on to the Grim Messenger paradox. And I think that is just true. I don't think that he does not understand it. I think he blundered in the first video. I was maybe too arrogant to probably own up to that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so he, uh, it's it's difficult again to refer it to like how do we how do we actually refer to his two videos? So the first one, I'll just call it his opening statement and then his rebuttal. So I won't call it a first rebuttal. I'll say opening statement and then recent rebuttal. Okay. So yeah, the first the opening statement in my view was uh, was great. It was a great contribution. It allowed me to make some clarifications, some important clarifications, defend some of the arguments, move the conversation in, I think, a productive direction. And then the the his, his recent rebuttal, the recent video, that I've already recorded my response to, so I'm not going to give a whole lot of details away of the way that I respond before it comes out. But that video uh, was a lot different from his first video. And, I mean, everybody... Every, everybody that I've talked to and everyone who's reached out to me on, on behalf of the debate and just saying like, okay, that that was a lot different. That's a, a nice way of putting it. The second video that he did was just very, very different. Nevertheless, I mean, I, I still think that these, like, it, it's easy to to fall into this, like, be, just being guided by your emotions and being guided by like, okay, this this really annoyed me. This really annoyed me. But instead, it, you know, it is supposed to be about the arguments. But in in addition to the arguments, it's about the person. It's about the person themselves and loving them despite, you know, all of this, all yeah. of these other things that are going on and what he might have said or what, what they might have been thinking at the time or what they didn't respond to or the way that they said something. It's easy to get drawn into, like, going in autopilot and letting your emotions just, like, flow and make sort of decisions for you. But I think if we can back out... And remember what we're called to do, and what we're called to do is be ambassadors for Christ, and it's all about sort of kingdom work as opposed to defending this person's ego or defending this person's reputation, defending my own reputation. I mean, that's that's the first thing that I wanted to do was to be like, no, I'm not straw manning you, and I'm, I'm not doing all of these things. I'm, I didn't shift any goalposts or anything like that. That's not what I was trying to do. And there are clarifications like that that needed to, to happen, but I guess the overall point is... It's, I mean, it's, it's, I'm, it's not easy. So this, I'm not saying like, you know, you, uh, it, I think anybody would, would want to feel the same way and, and respond sort of the way that you, I mean, I, I wanted to, to do some of the same things that you did, but I guess the, the point is that it's difficult, but I think we're supposed to, I think that we're supposed to forget about all that stuff and really focus on what's important. And what's important is Stephen is a human being. He is made in the image of God. Jesus loves him. I'm called to love him. Like I, uh, more than this debate and more than the responses, more than anything has happened, I want to focus on loving this person. And it's difficult. It's not easy. I mean, there, there's been t- like not just with Stephen. I've, ha- I mean, I've, I've done debates with atheists on Facebook and for years, and I would just like do all of these. I would say really condescending things, and I, th- I would like justify it in some way in my, in my own head and everything. But I, th- I just think that we're, we're called to, 
to do better and to just love them and see the person yes, we are, behind the argument. We, we, are, we are called to a higher standard, and I, I, I think I certainly failed that at a certain degree. That's why actually I made three videos. I just responded to it, and mm. then I did a recap on the debate that was not filled with any vitriol or something like that. You are completely right. I don't want to really defend myself for that, but I, what I want to say is what I just want to explain myself. What really got me angry is not Stephen or his uh -huh. misunderstanding or certain maybe his arrogance. What really got my blood boiling in this was I love philosophy of religion, mm -hmm. and I think he was doing a disservice to the philosophy of religion. Not really. It's not about the argument, and it's mm. not even that much about the existence of God, what he did actually, he gives away constantly the impression that philosophy, religion is not really something serious. And now oh, the okay. people who work in it are not really smart people because he can just take a day or two, read a little bit about it, get half of the stuff wrong, and then just declare to his audience that this is all just debunked. Right? That yeah. got my blood boiling. I see. I see. And so I there's some have, kind of like I, I see, and what you're saying is really true. I, I'm, I might actually just apologize, to Stephen, for some of the things I said. I just keep the video on. It is what it is. But some of the things got my blood boiling because I see that you are not really understanding the issues, but you still give away the impression as if you just completely debunk this without given any real, without having any real understanding about these issues. And I think that's wrong too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. There's, you you see so much value in the philosophy of religion. And I do too. And it's just, it can get, it can get under your skin when someone doesn't take it as seriously as you think they should. So I can, I can, yeah. And, and it wasn't just it, like a conversation between you and him. It was a very, very public thing. I mean, not, it wasn't even between you and him. It was between me and him. And I can, yes. I, I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that. Look, for well, example, okay. uh, Joe Schmidt from The Majesty of Reason, for example. He is an agnostic, but Stephen's response even got his blood boiling. He wrote <laughs> very long comments, for example, under the video explaining what everything was wrong. I mean, there are people who are maybe even more inclined to... Stephen said that we're mad about this, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I've I've even reached out to Joe in uh, to get his feedback on earlier versions of scripts and everything. So Joe's a, a, a great friend of mine. He's awesome, and he's obviously incredibly intelligent. I, I, I was watching, I think, your video where he mentioned him. You you mentioned uh, Joe, and you're like, this guy, like yes. this guy's uh, good. This guy's good. This guy's good. This, this guy's smart, something completely something else. else. Yeah, right. Exactly, which is like completely true. Yeah. He is he is something else, and I bet he's watching this and he's probably blushing. But uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I don't have a whole lot more to say. We could uh, what I would like to do, and here I I can go ahead and give you a public invitation to do this at the very end of my debate with Stephen. I would love to do a debate review with you and maybe Joe even and and uh, whoever else wants to join the party. Would you be open to that? Definitely. Awesome. Yeah, so I'll have you back on where we can actually talk because I've, I've been avoiding kind of some of the things that I, I do say in my rebuttal just because I kind of want to launch that and just actually it's going to be pretty soon. I'm hoping to launch it to patrons on Christmas Day. It's right now. All of the editing is done right now. We're working on graphics. I've got a guy that's helping me uh, up my graphics game, text flying in and sound effects and stuff. So hopefully it's going to look a little bit cooler in this next rebuttal. But if I can get it all done... I'm hoping to have it launched for everyone on Christmas Day, or at least uh, patrons, the supporters of the ministry, and then everyone else will get it uh, probably, you know, in, when, when I launch something early for patrons, it normally launches for them. Uh, the the most is about a week later. So uh, anyways, yeah, I would love to have you on once we once we end this debate, which you've got to watch my first rebuttal. I, I actually tell it, or my second rebuttal, I let you guys know uh, when the debate is coming to an end, which it is coming to an end, but I'll let you know in that second rebuttal, uh, all the, all the, the details there. But anyways, thank you so much for coming on and I'm really looking forward to having you back on. And I'm also looking forward to watching every single one of your videos that you post. I've got your notifications turned on in my phone. 
I watched every single one. They're awesome. In fact, I was listening uh, this morning as I was eating breakfast to your argument, uh, your overview of the evolutionary argument against naturalism. And that was a, a lot of fun to listen to while I was eating my, my bagel for breakfast. So anyways, keep doing, doing what you're doing. Video, like yeah, yeah thanks I love, for having I love me. that argument. Yeah, keep doing, keep pumping out those videos. I'll, uh, and everyone else, like go to his channel right now. If you like what I do on Capturing Christianity and you want to get like more, th okay, so the stuff that I cover on this channel, even the conversation that I had today with Pascal has been very high level, but he's like, he takes it another notch ab above. So if you're really interested in like deep level analysis of these arguments and just high level dialogue and assessment, philosophy of religion if any of that stuff interests you then definitely go over to his uh, his channel and subscribe he said he's at like 2.5 2.6 right now i would love to see him get over 3000 yeah. either today <laughs> or tomorrow i would love to see him grow more in popularity it'd be it'd be really really cool so yeah anyways thanks for coming on man yeah thanks for having me very very kind of you it was a great talk uh, awesome. Hope to see you is again, there anything man. that you'd like? Yeah. Is there anything that you'd like to leave with the audience? Um, no. I'm I'm actually very grateful to all the people that have subscribed uh, to my channel. I actually recently did a community post where I thanked my first subscriber, and I never thought that I did was see that happen. I started in March, and uh, yeah, uh, since I'm one of these COVID channels, so somebody who had suddenly some time on his hands, uh, it's just remarkable. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. All right, I will see you guys later in the next Capturing Christianity video. Again, coming up very soon. So stay tuned, subscribe, turn on the bell so you get notifications for more videos like this. Support the ministry. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you later.